Well, good morning, Calvary family. I'd like to uh, welcome you this Father's Day and say Happy Father's Day to all of our dads out there. Uh, we appreciate you. We are so blessed at our church here to have uh, wonderful, godly men that uh, are uh, not only uh, uh, very active in their roles and serving here in the body of Christ, but they're just they're good husbands and good fathers good examples, and they reflect well upon Jesus Christ. So we want to thank you and celebrate with you today and say way to go. Uh, we're excited for Father's Day. It's always uh, uh, a fun day to uh, celebrate uh, what God's doing in guys' lives. Uh, also, uh, you might be uh, dodging a few raindrops today. The last few days we've had some rain. Could have some more rain today and tomorrow. But I hope if you want to get outside today, dads, and enjoy the day, I hope you have the opportunity to do that. Uh, we're excited. Next week we get to open up as a church, and that'll be a 9 o'clock service. And that'll be social distancing. Uh, you can wear a mask. You don't have to wear a mask. Actually, tomorrow we'll be sending out an email, and that email will detail. There's two sheets we'd really like you to uh, look at because they're going to help you decide if this service is right for you, and then we do need you to pre-register if you want to attend this service. Uh, we need to do that for a number of reasons, and that sheet, I think, will help uh, you understand why we're requiring you to pre-register. We can have up to 135 people here, so if you'd like to attend that 9 o'clock worship service on the 28th, please pre-register. And if you are willing, you know that you're coming to that service, and you're willing to help volunteer at that service, we would really appreciate that you would let the office know by Tuesday. If you let us know, uh, there are just some um, basic areas of help that we need, volunteer help that we need, that will uh, just make things a lot smoother for us that day. Uh, we're kind of learning as we go, so uh, be patient with us. But we're looking forward to that. So it's a 9 o'clock service. You need to pre-register. Uh, come early so you can kind of self-distance as you're getting checked in. There's a check-in system. And then the, the seats, when you come into the sanctuary, the seats are going to be spread out. So there'll be seats for couples. There'll be seats for families. But they're all pretty spread out. It's going to look different. Uh, Mark has kind of described it as church weird. And it is kind of weird. It's going to be different. But it's going to be so nice to be back together. So we're really excited about that coming up the 28th. And if everything goes well with COVID, which we're hoping that our COVID numbers stay low in our community, in our area here, if that continues, we will go to two services on July 19th. That'll be a 9 o'clock and a 6 o'clock service. Also, I want to uh, make sure that you are aware, Pastor Mark is doing a Christian leadership uh, class coming up on the 30th of June. And if you'd like to uh, sign up for that, if you want more information about that, there is a card on the website that you can check out as far as uh, that class is concerned. And there is a deadline for registering for that, and that is coming up this next week. So if you're interested in that, please check the website and register if that's something that looks good for you. Well, our call to worship today comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 68. Rise up, O Lord, and scatter your enemies. Let those who hate God run for their lives. Blow them away like smoke. Melt them like wax in a fire. Let the wicked perish in the presence of God. But let the godly rejoice. Let them be glad in God's presence. Let them be filled with joy. Sing praises to the Lord and to his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in his presence. Father to the fatherless, defender of the widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. But he makes the rebellious live in a son scorched land. Let's continue to worship together.
This is our time we normally take our offering, and we'd like to uh, once again thank you for your faithfulness, continued faithfulness. We had a congregational business meeting here this last week. We had an opportunity to celebrate all the great things God's doing, and you are a huge, huge part of that. And we're just really excited as we continue to move forward with the plans God has given us for this church and to uh, reach not only our community but our region with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the generosity of your people. Lord, we know that you are the one that moves hearts and gives people the motivation uh, to give and invest in the work that you're doing. Um, it is very humbling for us as a, as a church in general, but us as, as staff and leadership to see your provision. And we want to acknowledge you in this. We want to thank you in this. And we want to thank you for the congregation's faithfulness. Lord, today is Father's Day. And we know with Father's Day comes just a real mix of emotions. Uh, we want to celebrate Father's Day. Fathers are a great thing. You uh, created uh, fathers and mothers. You created the family. You ordained them. You gave fathers a certain role. You gave mothers a certain role. And fathers have just an awesome opportunity to uh, lovingly uh, lead as servant leaders in their homes and in their households. And Lord, we have some great fathers here at Calvary, and we just thank you for them. We thank you for the way that you are continuing to mold them and strengthen them and disciple them how you are working in their lives. Lord, we pray that you give them wisdom. We pray that you give them protection. We pray that you give them sensitivity, sensitive hearts, Lord, that you would give them um, patience and grace. Lord, that you would help them not only to be good providers uh, financially and physically, Lord, but you'd help them to be awesome providers spiritually as you speak through their lives. We also know that today is a tough day. It's a tough day for those who maybe didn't have a good relationship with their father or those who maybe uh, are missing their father today. 
Uh, their father has, is, is gone, or maybe they have a relationship that has been severed for some reason with their father, and it's, it's a painful day. Lord, we know that we just read you are a father to the fatherless, and we know that you are the awesome, you are the greatest father there could ever, ever be. So, Lord, I pray that for those who are hurting today, for those who um, are in pain, Lord, that you'd wrap your loving arms around them, that you'd shower shower them with your um, comfort, with your peace, with your presence. And Lord, that you would reassure them that you are their father. And Lord, I pray that even today, maybe today would be a day of reconciliation where there might be some breakdowns in relationships. And today, maybe is the day that some of those relationships can be healed. And Lord, I know that we uh, talk about reconciliation. You have given us the power. You have given us the, the resources. You have given us your spirit to help us take steps of reconciliation with one another. So I pray that for all of our church family today. And if it comes with father relationships, that would be awesome. But for all relationships. Lord, we pray for our country. Our country is in a tough spot right now. These are difficult days. And Lord, I know that many people are looking for political answers, and there might be some political answers, but there is no political answer that is greater than the true answer. And the true answer, Jesus, is you. You are the answer because you are the Prince of Peace. You are the one that came to reconcile us to sinful men and women to a holy, righteous, and just God. You came to reconcile us. And by placing our faith in you, we are empowered to be agents of reconciliation. But Lord, our our nation and the world, as as far as that's concerned, are looking for answers, but you are the answer. I pray for the church. I pray that the church would, would steward out our love for you and our love for one another in such a way that people would see that we are different. When the church doesn't look any different than society, um, we have problems. Lord, I pray you want us to be set apart. You want us to reflect you. You want us to reflect your love and your caring and your hope and your message of glory for all mankind. And I pray that you'd help us at Calvary, but help us just in the church in general, the big church, to do that well. We pray for healing, not only in churches, but we pray for healing in our land. And Lord, I pray that you'd encourage every man, woman, um, boy and girl who are listening this morning. I pray that you would encourage them, that they would um, have uh, just... uh, uh, the love of, of the Father um, just surging through them today. I pray that you continue to pro- protect, protect us from COVID, continue to provide, continue to encourage, continue to um, protect our community. Uh, Lord, bless our local businesses, our business people, uh, those that come and visit our area, Lord. We pray that, that their time here would be special And Lord, that this would be not only a place of relaxation, but a place of refreshment. And we ask these things now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, Calvary, good morning and thanks for joining us today. We're glad you can be with us online and we're looking forward to next Sunday, June 28, being a soft reopening. Don't forget to pre-register. You can go on our church website and do that tomorrow. And we do want to give you one more announcement. Next week's online service is going to begin premiering at 9 a.m. each Sunday. So if you're wanting to get going with uh, Sunday afternoon activities, picnics, time with family, you'll be able to start that church service earlier at 
9 a.m. if you want. Uh, one more thing I'll mention, on Tuesday, June 30th, we start a Zoom class on Christian leadership. We've got spots still open for registration. We'd love to have you involved. We're gonna go five weeks on Tuesday nights and that's a Zoom meeting. Uh, we're gonna be going through John Maxwell's book, Winning with People. If you haven't ordered it, do it today. It's a great read, and we're really looking forward to an enjoyable time together, so please sign up. So today, we are in the book of Genesis, chapter 32. If you got a Bible, go ahead and find it. First book in the Bible, and uh, we are in a story with a man named Jacob, who I call the bad wrestler. Now, before you uh, read through the book of Genesis, and if you haven't done it, do it this summer, uh, go to the Bible Project. They've got these short 10-minute videos that'll give you a snapshot of what the whole book is about. And it's kind of like getting a blueprint before you start going through a building. And uh, a lot of ink and argument gets spilled on the first three chapters of Genesis, basically arguing over how old is dirt. But you need to know, most of the book of Genesis is a family story about a large, complicated family full of dysfunctional people who've been brought into God's plan to bless the whole world. So if you've never read past Genesis 1 and 2, keep on going because you've only opened the beginning of a very important book that sets really a trajectory for the rest of the Bible. Well, in the middle of all that family drama in chapters 11 to 50 of Genesis, what we find is a story of Jacob right here in the middle, and we meet him today at a crucial spot in his life. Um, but before we dig into that, uh, there's something I want you to, to think about. We live in an upside down world and often live upside down lives. We have a creator God who loves us and wants to bless us, and yet many times, People will run from God, argue with God, debate with God, struggle with God, fight against God. Uh, sometimes we have the brains of a squirrel stuck in a swimming pool. And so I got a little video that I want you to see that uh, kind of gives a snapshot of somehow kind of the way that we treat God. Don't touch him. I need gloves. Don't touch him. I have to help him. Give me something to get out Get a board. Please. Yeah, put the chair. Sometimes uh, we treat God the way that squirrel treated the girl who was trying to rescue it. Um, we can run from God. We can even fight against God, fearful that he's one not to be trusted. And yet God loves us, has created us, and wants a relationship where he blesses us and we enjoy life with him. Well, today we meet Jacob, and he's been a man who's uh, been on the run from family more than once, and he's been struggling with God his entire life. So we meet him at this juncture point. Um, after 20 years living with an uncle named Laban, who is also his boss and also his father-in-law, their relationship had gotten so complicated and tense that Jacob decided he was going to pack his bags and run away without letting Laban know, even though he was taking Laban's daughters and grandkids with him. Well, that did not work out very well. If you're ever on the run for your life, try and not do it with thousands of head of livestock, four wives, and a boatload of kids. Uh, it really slows you down. So their relationship was so bad that in chapter 31, they literally make a peace treaty so that they won't go to war with each other. <laughs> and that's the backdrop that Jacob has behind him as he's on the run. But now he's coming back to his homeland and in front of him, he is anticipating a brother Esau who he's had a broken relationship for over 20 years. 
uh, when they were much younger, his brother Esau was a fool and a hothead. And frankly, Jacob was a liar, a cheat and a thief. And when they last parted company, Esau had vowed that he would kill his brother Jacob. So that's the rock and the hard place that all of Jacob's conniving and scheming in life have put him in. And he's at this point where he is vulnerable, his family, his possessions are all vulnerable, and he really needs God to rescue him. And yet, to be honest, He's still pretty well relying on himself. So if you got that Bible open, Genesis 32 is where we're starting. I'm going to pray before we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for um, what we find in the Bible of ordinary, broken, struggling people with all kinds of life problems. And yet you, Lord God, are all powerful. You are present everywhere. You have a plan that is good and you desire to bless us. Lord, as we come to Jacob's story today, I pray that your word will speak to our life story, that we would be people who are ready to stop struggling against you and start surrendering to your loving leadership. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So Genesis 32, let's read it. <clears throat> uh, As Jacob started on his way again, angels of God came to meet him. And when Jacob saw them, he exclaimed, this is God's camp. So he named the place Mahanaim. So we're going to take a pause there for a minute. Uh, sometimes we think that people in the Bible always had revelations from God and visions of God. And the truth is, for ordinary people, they were normally very scarce. Jacob has had a few moments like this in his life where God has given him an unusual vision. And we would love more detail, but the story really just gets to the point. As Jacob is in this vulnerable, dangerous position, God gives him a vision of the presence of God's angelic army around him. And Jacob is so taken by what he experiences that he names the place Mahanaim, which means two camps, Jacob's camp and God's camp. So understand that the first thing we come to here is that when Jacob is in trouble and in danger, God's presence is still there, even though it is unseen or unexperienced by most of the world. So let's pick up then in verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead of his to his brother Esau, who was living in the region of Seir in the land of Edom. He told them, give this message to my master Esau. Humble greetings from your servant Jacob. You catch that? Jacob doesn't even call himself brother. He calls Esau the master and himself the servant. Uh, he says, until now I've been living with Uncle Laban, and now I own cattle, donkeys, flocks of sheep and goats, and many servants, both men and women. I have sent these messengers to inform my Lord, that's Esau, his brother, of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me. After delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, we met your brother Esau, and he is already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household along with the flocks and herds and camels into two groups. He thought if Esau meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group can escape. So when you think of this story, Jacob and Esau coming together, don't think of them as simply two brothers. Don't think of them just as family members. Picture Esau as like a tribal chieftain, really a warlord who's got 400 men under his command and his coming with what Jacob assumes are hostile intentions to take revenge after 20 years of resentment. You can imagine how Jacob is terrified, realizing not only his personal danger, but the danger of his family, his kids, his wives, his servants and staff. Everything that he holds dear in this world is immediately threatened. And that moves Jacob to prayer. Verse 9, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives. And you promised me, I will treat you kindly. I am not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you have shown me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I own nothing except a walking stick. Now my whole household fills two large camps. Oh Lord, please 
Rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promised me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. Well, Jacob stayed where he was for the night. And then he selected these gifts for from his possessions to present to his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. He divided these into herds and assigned each to different servants. And then he told his servants, go ahead of me with the animals, but keep some distance between the herds. He gave these instructions to the men leading the first group. When my brother Esau meets you, he will ask, whose servants are you? Where are you going? Who owns these animals? You must reply, they belong to your servant Jacob, but they are a gift for his master Esau. Look, he is coming right behind us. Jacob gave the same instructions to the second and third herdsmen and to all who followed behind the herds. You must say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say, look, your servant Jacob is right behind us. Jacob thought, I will try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. So the gifts were sent on ahead while Jacob himself spent that night in the camp. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. So you can see what's going on here. Uh, Jacob has prayed to the Lord for protection, but he is still very much relying on his own plan and scheme. He's got an enormous series of gifts he's going to hopefully pay off Esau with to buy some goodwill. He's got the lines scripted for the staff of exactly what they're supposed to say, but he's still expecting the worst. He takes his own family and divides them and the rest of the livestock into two camps because he's working under the assumption Esau is probably going to attack us. Maybe I can get away with half my family and half my possessions. That's where he is at, very much relying on himself, his own plans, his own wits, his own schemes. And yet, he's a man who knows God. He's a man who is praying to God for help. He is a man who is wrestling with fear and yet wanting to live by faith. So what does he know about God? He knows that God has been faithful to his family in the past. He knows that God has made some tremendous promises for his family of uh, descendants and of a land, a home, and also of a blessing, not only for their own family, but for the nations. He is aware of all this, and he understands that God has been kinder and more merciful to him than he could ever deserve. He's really appealing to God for grace, for protection, for mercy that he realizes he does not deserve. So he is in the middle of danger. He is trying to figure out the answer himself, and he is calling on God for help. Now, what he could not have anticipated is the way that God was going to answer that prayer. So let's read on, beginning at verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. And then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. 
And even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. Now, I want you to understand something about this wrestling match. This encounter with the angel of the Lord or with God was God's answer to Jacob's plea for protection. Jacob had come to the end of himself. He was out of options. He was out of a place to escape. He had no way to defend himself. And so he's crying out to God for help, even as he's still trying to pay off Esau and win his good Esau and, and earn his good will. But <clears throat> what has been characteristic of Jacob's whole life is this struggling and conflict. His very name Jacob means heel grabber. In other words, going through life, Jacob has been the kind of man who's willing to trip somebody up to get ahead. He's willing to cheat, lie, and steal if it will advance his own goals. That's the kind of man that Jacob has been. And yet, from God's point of view, all this struggling with his family is in reality a wrestling and a struggling with God. Jacob has been a man who's had a few rare encounters with God, but is very much struggling to trust and depend on the Lord. So this wrestling match begins, and it goes all night. By the time the sun is coming up, picture Jacob drenched in sweat. Every muscle in his body is burning. He's exhausted. When this is done, he's going to need a bottle of ibuprofen and a tub full of ice to sit in. And when I come to verse 25, I don't know whether to read it with a touch of irony or God has a sense of humor. Because look at what it says. First line, when the stranger, that is the man Jacob's wrestling against, saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. He didn't hit him. He didn't kick him. He didn't do a body slam. He says, well, I'm not winning. And with a touch on his hip, Jacob is crippled. His hip is dislocated. Picture enormous pain. A man screaming and writhing on the ground. And yet, look at what happens next. The stranger says, let me go for the dawn is breaking. And Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. <clears throat> Jacob knows this is no ordinary wrestling match. Jacob knows that he is up against the angel of the Lord. The very one that he has cried out to for protection is the one who has been wrestling with him all night and is the one who has just with a single touch dislocated his hip. And yet... Jacob does not want God to run away from him. He clings to God, wanting desperately the promise that God had given his family line. And look at what the angel of the Lord said. First, a question. What is your name? Now, the Lord already knew who Jacob was. He didn't need information. What he needed from Jacob was a confession. I am Jacob. I am the heel grabber. I am the person who trips people up to get ahead. I am the one who has deceived my own family more than once. I am the one who's constantly trying to manipulate my way to get from God what only God can give by grace. And we'll look what the Lord said in reply. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord said, Your name will no longer be Jacob. You are no longer the heel grabber. You are no longer the liar, cheat, and deceiver said, from now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. What does Israel mean? It means the one who either fights with God or the one for whom God fights, depending on how you read it. It can mean both those things. And that was characteristic not only of Jacob's life, but it would be characteristic of his descendants, his sons. It would be characteristic of the nation which later bore his name. There would be the constant tension between Israel and their God of whether they were fighting against God or whether they were surrendering to God and allowing God to fight for them. That was Jacob's story. That's the story of these Genesis families. That ultimately would be the story of the entire Old Testament. What is the attitude of our heart towards God? Are the blessings of God something that we get by our wits and schemes and tripping up whoever we have to to get what we want? 
Or is instead there a relationship with a good, gracious, generous God whom we can trust and he is able to protect us. He does provide for all of our needs. He is a God who delights to bless us, but none of that happens unless we're willing to surrender ourselves to him and entrust our future to his leadership. Look at what it says here. Um, Jacob said, please tell me your name. <clears throat> Look at the answer he got. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. And then he blessed Jacob. <clears throat> you understand, Jacob had won nothing here by force. He couldn't compel God to do anything. He could not require the angel of the Lord to give him his name. He's entirely in the Lord's hands. The Lord who dislocated his hip with a touch could just as easily have dislocated his life. And yet his life has been spared and God has been merciful to him. So look at what Jacob does. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Folks, here's what I want to leave you with today. If you want to fight God, you can. If you want to struggle with him, go ahead. If you want to run from him, you can try that. My question is, how do you think all of that will work out? The truth is, if you struggle with God, God will wear you out. The truth is, if you try and outrun God, God's legs will always be stronger than yours. The truth is, if you want to try and outsmart God or out-argue God, God has seen it all before and we will never be equipped to compel God to do what we want. We will never be in position to, to bring into our life the blessings of God except by surrendering ourselves to him and trusting him. So in the New Testament, they talk about two important words, grace, that is God's generosity to us, and faith, that is our simply trusting him. And Jacob's life this night is very much an example of that. He was in a time and situation that was out of his control. He was in danger not only from his uh, brother, but frankly, the Lord God could have taken his life that night. And yet, Jacob pleaded with the Lord for mercy. And mercy is exactly what he received. And he got a new name and he got a blessing. And he also walked away with a limp. that would be a lasting reminder to himself and to all of his family of what happens when a man struggles with the Lord. Folks, my question for you today is, have you come to your penile moment yet? Have you come to the place in life where you've quit arguing, struggling, and fighting with God? Uh, you can struggle with God if you want to. He will wear you out. Uh, you will never be able to outthink God. You will never be able to outrun God. You will never be able to outmuscle God. He is all knowing. He is everywhere present. He is almighty. But here's what you can do you can entrust yourself to the God who's the creator of the universe, who has already provided for you every good thing in life, who has protected your life all of your days and who actually desires to bless you and transform you. But if you want to win that blessing, it starts by surrendering to him. It starts by acknowledging that he is God and Lord and you are not. And the good things in your life, they're gifts from him. You want to be blessed. You want to be happy. You want to know that you have a home in eternity. You want to know that you're doing something significant and meaningful in your life. Folks, all those things are gifts from a good God. But the key for us today is to stop fighting against him, to stop struggling and simply trust and obey. If we try to exalt ourselves by human means, the Bible says that God will turn us upside down and humble us. And Jacob certainly got humbled that night. But the Bible also says that if we will humble ourselves before God, he will exalt us in his time and in his way. Well, I want to show you one more bad wrestler. And for that, we're going to go back to my house to wrap up this message. So join me back at my home. 
So folks, the best commentary on the story of Jacob is the Old Testament prophet Hosea. And this is what he writes in chapter 12. He says, even in the womb, Jacob struggled with his brother. When he became a man, he even fought with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and won. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from God. There at Bethel, he met God face to face and God spoke to him, the Lord God of heaven's armies. So <clears throat> when you think about what it meant for Jacob to win, it meant that he surrendered to the God who was always going to be more powerful than he was. And yet in that moment of weeping and tears and pain, he realized the closeness and power and goodness of God who spared his life. And not only spared his life, but had a lot more blessings in store for him. So why did I bring you back here to uh, meet Rex here? Rex is a good dog and he's a lousy wrestler. Right now he's a teenager, which means he has enough tr energy to get in trouble every day and not enough brains to stay out of trouble. And every night for the last walk of the evening about bedtime, he wants to fight me. Now, most of the day he'll be relaxed. We can go for walks, play fetch. He's pretty well behaved most of the time. But at night he gets feisty. He wants to mix it up, jump at me, get all crazy. It always ends the same way. He always ends up pinned on the ground. Now, I was not a fabulous wrestler, but I had a very good coach and I was part of a very good team. This dog has no wrestling coach. He has no wrestling team. Frankly, he's got no moves. He's got no technique. He's got a ton of energy, but for every pound that he brings to the mat, I bring two. And the wrestling matches always end up the same way. He's in a headlock, I'm on top of him, until finally he whimpers a little bit, and then the wrestling match is all over, and we can go back to playing fetch, go to work, play games, and most of all have snacks. I will tell you, this dog loves snacks. So why do I mention this to wrap up our message? Because a lot of us are prone to wrestle and fight and argue and debate with God. And you just have to think through, how do you really expect that to turn out? For every pound you bring to a wrestling match, God brings omnipotence. As far as God is concerned, when it comes to combating him, you have no coach and no team. And here's the biggest disadvantage Rex has. I have two thumbs. He has none. When you're wrestling, thumbs are very important. I want you to understand something, folks. If you want to fight God, if you want to wrestle him, you got no thumbs. So think about that, because the truth is, I don't need to wrestle and fight my dog. I trained him for other purposes, and the truth is we enjoy each other a lot, and I'm the guy who provides all the snacks. And our relationship with God is a little bit like that. You can always fight him if you want to. He will always wear you out, because as far as God is concerned, you will always be a bad wrestler. On the other hand, what you can be is a good follower. You can love him, you can trust him, you can surrender your life to him today. And the truth is, if you will become a person who is in the habit of surrendering your will to his, you will experience God's blessing and you will win everything that really matters. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the story of Jacob and all the families that we find in the Bible. They are all full of problems and struggles that we are familiar with. Lord, may we learn from them how to walk with you. May we learn to not be um, a curse on our families, but to be a blessing to the people around us. And Lord, ultimately, may we learn what it means to trust and honor you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.